Good evening, friends. I see some of you have logged on. Sorry for the blank air there for a few minutes, but I think it helps uh, some of us get logged on. If, if I don't start talking uh, in the first second of the of the live stream, so that's sort of the method of the madness. Um, but uh, I'm back when all this started, uh, when the pandemic began back in March, and we started doing learning how to do live stream and so forth. Uh, one of the things that I did was try and find a good place in the church building or wherever I was, sometimes at home, to broadcast from. I went all kinds of different places in the building and, uh, and I'm someplace tonight that I haven't been before and that is in the uh, fellowship hall um, where the last couple of weeks several of you have sat in here and watched a uh, video, a, a live video of the worship going on just down the hallway and you worshiped in here. Um, and so I'm in our fellowship hall with our beautiful new kitchen behind me. It's been new for about a year now and we haven't really got to enjoy it uh, a lot unless you work here. Uh, but we look forward to the day, hopefully soon, when we can get back together and fellowship in this room. Uh, but um, we, we still have some more work to do, don't we, uh, to get through this pandemic. But um, this evening, uh, we welcome you to our study. We're going to be studying in James chapter 2. And uh, I did send out uh, a, a little handout by email to those that are on our list if that's a help to you to sort of follow along and jot some things down. If not, if you just listen well, then, then you can follow along with that. But we're going to uh, be uh, studying there in James 2 this evening in this continuing search for God's wisdom in Scripture. Let's pray as we begin. Holy Father, you are so good and, and great and awesome and if anything this year has taught us, it is how much we need you and we cry out to you and, and we beg your intervention in our world and that you will get us through this challenging time where we're fighting this virus and, and trying to get back to some kind of normalcy in life. We're so appreciative of scientists and doctors and healthcare workers who are working to, uh, to fight this, help us all to be doing our part as well. Help us as a church to know what to do during these times. Uh, and, and just thank you for caring for us. Help us not only to be concerned about our physical safety, but our spiritual health. And, and show us all we can do to grow in spirit during this time. Thank you for your word, the wisdom that's in it. Help us to Seek it out this evening for a few minutes in this great letter that your servant James wrote to uh, the first century church and now to those of us here 2,000 years later. Thank you for Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. All right. So again, James chapter 2. I was thinking about the, the topic and, and remembering uh, not so much now, I guess maybe a little bit still now, but uh, when we were raising our children, uh, the biggest fights that that took place or arguments, uh, thankfully there were never physical fights, at least I don't remember any. Uh, if there were, I lost. But uh, the fights that occurred uh, in our house seemed to be when somebody felt that they were being treated unfairly. And maybe that's the same way at, at, your, at your house. You know, somebody was told to clean something up and another person, you know, argued about it. And, and that's not fair because they didn't make the mess, you know, and why do I have to clean it up and, and um, that kind of thing. And, and she gets to do this or that. Why don't I get to do that? And um, there was a time of year where, where they'd be, I'd be hearing, you know, Dad, you're watching football again. That's not fair. Uh, that was before 
the era where there's a TV in every room. Uh, and sometimes that would be the complaint. Uh, but really what, what wasn't fair was that the Browns never won. You know, that's not fair. But anyway, from, from time to time, um, you know, as, as we grow up, that kind of thing happens. And, and, and from the time we're, that we're little children, we sort of innately know when something isn't fair. We can sense unfairness. We have uh, an ability to detect injustice, unfairness, uh, unfairness. Uh, it's sort of within us, maybe created within us. We know thing, you know. We know when things are out of balance, when things are unequal. And one of the earliest lines we learn, it seems, is "No fair. That's not fair." We've all said it, and we've certainly all heard it a lot. And and, and we don't forget how to say it, do we? We we can say it just as passionately at age seventy as we can at age seven. And again, I think it's probably true that God created within us a sense of what is fair and what is not. Now that sense can get off and we can, we can uh, be mistaken in that sometimes, of course, but we have this sense within us. And it, it's easy to detect when we're being treated unfairly. And it's pretty easy to see when, when, uh, when someone else is being treated unfairly. It's not so easy to know when we're treating someone else unfairly. That's a little bit harder, but they know when it's happening. And you know, from the beginning, God has been a God who treats people fairly. Now, if we're gonna be his people, we have to be the same way, don't we? Uh, I want you to look at an Old Testament verse with me for a moment. It's a description of our God. It comes in the law in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 17. It says there, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, and that's a pretty powerful statement of who he is. Uh, he, he is the, the God. But then this is at the end of this, this verse. Who is not partial and takes no bribe. So in this great verse, who, who, which states what God is, what he's like, he's great, he's mighty, he's awesome. He is God of gods, Lord of lords. Notice it has this part that says he is fair. He is not partial. He does not take bribes. And is very prominent in his description. God shows no partiality to people. He doesn't favor one over the other. He shows no favoritism. Now, it's impossible for us to be that way you know, 100% of the time. None of us would get a 100% on the fairness exam. But for God, he's 100% fair all the time. He treats all equally. And the phrase in that verse where it says, God is not partial, very picturesque phrase in the original language. It literally means he does not lift the face. Now, what's that all about? What does it mean? Well, you have to sort of picture a king or a lord of some sort um, with some of his subjects, you know, they're bowed down on the ground before him, their noses pressed to the ground, sign of obeisance. And he taps one of them on the shoulder and lifts his face from that bowing position, lifts his face. And just him, just does it to him, shows favor to the one to the exclusion of the others. He's partial to the one over the others. That's sort of the picture of this word that's used in Deuteronomy 10, 17. And so this verse says God is not that way. 
He shows no partiality. He does not lift the face. He is fair 100%. Uh, Paul in the New Testament repeats this concept. Romans chapter 2, verse 11, he says, God shows no partiality. And then Peter says the very same thing in the book of Acts chapter 10, verse 34. Again, God shows no partiality. So all through the Bible, the claim is made that God is a fair God. So it makes sense that he wants his people to be a fair people. So it's in that context that we should hear the words of James uh, this evening in James chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. We might say it this way, as a follower of Jesus, be fair. Treat people equally. Don't play favorites. Now, we might ask, you know, how can we play favorites in the church? Is it possible to not treat people equally among Christians? Well, it certainly was in James's day, and I imagine, you know, it hasn't changed. They were struggling with this, ver this very thing um, in the church that James was concerned about. So I want you to notice the situation he describes there again at the beginning of James 2. We read verse 1, but notice verses 2, 3, and 4. He says this, For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now, I think it's helpful to remember that James is writing to uh, Jewish Christians. They were mostly poor, probably nearly all poor. They lived in a time, which is sort of hard for us to imagine, a time when there was no middle class of any kind, no middle class in the ancient world like we're used to. We're, we sort of assume there's like rich and then middle class and then poor. Not in the ancient world. You were either wealthy, which was less than 10% of the population, or you were poor, one or the other. There was no in-between. And, and so most of the Jewish Christians that James was writing to in these churches were poor. They were laborers, probably in agriculture, and they all had to deal all the time with the rich landowning class um, that was not always fair with its workforce. We see some more detail of this later in James in, in chapter 5. I want to read part of that. I want you to hear the very strong language that James uses in chapter 5. And, and he directs it against these wealthy landowners. It's uh, the beginning of James 5 and about five or six verses there. Again, this, the audience here isn't the poor Jewish Christians from chapter 2, but now he seems to be speaking to the wealthy. You wonder if they ever heard this, this message or is this sort of a, a rhetorical device that James uses in his writing here. But he says... James 5, 1, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. 
You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Well, that's, that's pretty strong stuff and gives some powerful insight into how God feels about those who treat others unfairly. You know, James says to them, you're going to get yours. You may be living high on the hog now, but you're going to get yours. God is not partial. He does not like it when people treat people unfairly. It's against his very nature. It is, in fact, sin. And that's why uh, what James describes in the passage we began with, uh, chapter 2, doesn't seem to make much sense. These people he was writing to knew what it meant to be treated unfairly. They knew inequality in their daily life. They knew it firsthand. Uh, they, they had that innate sense for detecting injustice just like we do. And so why then would they turn around and do the very same thing to others? Why would we, who, who know what it feels like to be treated unfairly, who know injustice when we see it, why would we ever be partial with others? Well, that's the question that um, this lesson brings. It's a hard question. Well, James asks it this way, uh, back chapter 2, just reading on a little bit, verses 5, 6, and 7. Listen to how he asks the question. Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you? And the ones who drag you into court, are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? You can just sort of hear the frustration in the apostle's voice. Now, why in the world would people who are daily oppressed by these rich landowners and, you know, not paid by them when they're supposed to be or what they're supposed to be paid, they're dragged into court by them, and whose faith is mocked by them. You notice it says, they dishonor the name of the God you serve. Why in the world would they ever show special honor to a rich man who comes into their assembly of the church while essentially telling a poor man to go sit on the floor? Make a special place for the rich man and tell, tell the poor man, I'll just find some place. That's what apparently had happened or was happening in the churches James was dealing with. Someone would walk into the assembly of the church and obviously they were wealthy, they're in the finest clothes, they have the best designer wear, they're flashing maybe a gaudy ring, and they'd be offered a good seat, the best place. Why? I don't know. Maybe for the same reason that we tend to admire and and adore the rich and famous today. Uh, maybe for the same reason that publications like People Magazine are so successful, or the dozens of TV shows that, that uh, focus on the rich and all their splendor and wealth, and, and we, 
we tune into those things and you sort of sit back and soak it all up. Maybe um, for, for the same reason that, that spoiled wealthy athletes are more famous than hardworking, no-name soldiers on the front lines. Maybe they thought, hey, we must be getting something right. Look at this rich person coming into our church. Let's give him a good seat. Maybe we could get more of them here. Think what that'll do for our church budget. All the while, the poor man in shabby clothing is left to find a place, if he can, on his own, maybe on a dirty floor. I guess the, the lesson is really all about how much we're, we're going to allow the standards of the world to influence the way we treat people. Uh, our world exalts riches and, and prosperity and fine clothes and fancy cars and expensive vacations and first class living in the right neighborhoods and private this and private that. These are the things that impress in our world. They just can't be what impresses in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, in the church, there is to be no partiality, no favoritism. It's to be a place where all stand equally before God. Now, it's a place where we treat each other right, where we treat our guests right, no matter who they are, no matter what they look like, where they come from, what they wear. Um, you know, there are people I've heard through the years, um, and I don't know how much stock to put in this, but I, I've heard people say they, they don't come to church because they, they think you have to dress a certain way. Uh, we certainly dress less formally than we did at one time in most churches, and that's fine. I, I just I hope they're mistaken in an impression that they might have that they have to impress in some way that's not based on some kind of real experience. But just in case, you know, we didn't get the point, um, in the first seven verses of chapter two of James, he really drives it home in verses eight and nine. It's almost like, uh, you know, he, he says, uh, in case you didn't hear me, listen to this. He says, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. And James says, uh, let me make myself perfectly clear. This partiality business is a salvation issue. To show partiality, to be unfair, is to sin. And, and he refers to the royal law which he defines as love your neighbor as yourself. You ever wonder why that's called the royal law? It's the royal law because it's the law of the king. King Jesus, you see. It's his law. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how Jesus lived. He treated all people equally. We know that. We know he treated the poor and the destitute and the sick and the very young and women uh, very well. And he had some occasions to be around the rich and powerful and he treated them with the same respect. He treated people with dignity. And, you know, it didn't matter if it was Governor Pilate uh, near the end of his life, or if it was a leper or a prostitute, um, he, he loved 
his neighbor. And you see, with Jesus, and, and particularly at the cross of Jesus, all things are made equal. Because everybody from highest to lowest has to come to the cross to find God. Uh, scripture says every knee must bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, without exception. You see, it's not partial. That applies to everybody. At the cross, we all find our place. It's level ground at the cross. And so that's another way of expressing this idea that, that James begins a chapter with, my brothers show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. All things being equal. It's got to be that way in the kingdom of God. And may we strive to make it so. Hope you have a great evening. God bless you. And uh, find someone to bless the rest of this week. See you soon. Bye.